Hello everybody, my name is Sagarika Nath and I'm from India and I was a part of Dr. Da uh, Dasharma group this summer. Today I'll be presenting an uh, presenting overview on DNA repair in extreme of fires. But before directly moving into the topic and I, what I learned this summer, I would like to take you through a few topics of extraterrestrial life and alien life. So like we have always like at some point of time discussed about alien life amongst ourselves. We have wondered like, are we alone? Do we have aliens looking for us? But whenever we imagine aliens, we often imagine them to be something like this with a UFO, just the way we see them in movies, in books, and in news. But don't you think alien life could be something like this? For a layman, we don't imagine it to be like this, but this could also be possible alien life, something more simpler because we don't know whether alien life is more simpler or more complex than us, but this could be a uh, possibility. But this is not an alien. This is our very own Deinococcus radiodurans and bacteria very important from an astrobiological point of view. Why? Because it has very high UV resistant properties. So why is UV resistance important when we talk about astrobiology? Because in extraterrestrial space outside Earth, the, if organisms are exposed, there'll be a large amount of UV radiation, which might cause DNA damage. And DNA damage, if accumulated, can have severe outcomes. So we are constantly looking for such extremophiles which can withstand these damages. So from here, I'd like to take you to the extremophiles. So extremophiles are organisms that can survive in extremely harsh conditions, just like we saw in UV. They are also found in ice, boiling water, acid, alkali, in the core of nuclear reactor, right? That is so bizarre. And we consider these spaces not to be inhospitable by life, but we find them. So these extremophiles are extremely important because there have been a lot of papers where it has been suggested that if we identify such suitable candidates, we can take them to space missions, check whether they are uh, suitable for space travel and not affect their reproduce, reproducing capability. So the figures over here you see, the first one is the visual representation of the radiation reaching Mars. So as we know, Mars does not have an ozone layer. So it is not protected by, uh, from the UV damage of the uh, sun like Earth. So if we consider organisms to be present there, or if we send organisms there, it be UV radiation is very important. We need to take care that the organism has such systems which it can repair you, its own DNA damage. The second picture over here is from Lonar Lake, Maharashtra, India. It was caused by an asteroid and it got filled with water. And a few years back, it suddenly turned pink, right? And we'll look into why it turned big suddenly in the next slide. So extremophiles are any organism that can survive in extreme conditions. It could be eukaryotes, it could be bacteria, it could be archaea. So for simplicity, archaea are single-celled organisms similar to bacteria, and they're often found mostly in extreme environments. So that is why we chose since archaea, especially an archaea called haloarchaea, which is found in extremely high salt concentrations. Like it requires salt for its optimal growth and can grow up to saturated conditions. The major takeover, takeaway here is that it is found in um, conditions or in environment where the UV radiation is naturally very high and still it uh, successfully survives over there. It also has a large number of important features like its growth gets enhanced with light, it produces carotenoids, those pink pigments that we talked about, those carotenoids in high concentration, which cause such attractive pink ponds. Like you can see in the picture over here, the California uh, salt ponds, that. And some of them can also grow in anaerobic conditions. Some of them have high GC content. GC content means like DNA, we have four nucleotides, A, C, G, T. So the um, organisms that have higher number of G and Cs are called to be GC rich. They also have multiple copies of the genome. So why are these characteristics important? Because they help haloarchaea deal with DNA damage caused by UV light as well as other conditions. Like it has multiple copies. So if some information is lost via a DNA damage, there is always backup because it has multiple copies. Then there is carotenoids. Carotenoids have antioxidant properties, which often help in DNA repair. Then there is high GC content. Many papers have found that to be also very helpful in battling DNA damage. 
so that is why halo arc is so extremely important because it firstly experiences such high amount of uv light and secondly it has such good systems to repair the dna damage caused so over here i just remove So DNA damage faced by haloarchaea. There are a large variety of reasons which cause such DNA damage. Just like we discussed the UV light, the radiation, and then the salt, the salt in which the high concentration of salt in which it resides, that also contributes to DNA damage. So in the figure, you can see there are various factors mentioned on the top, which cause DNA damage. DNA, like the DNA is double-stranded. There could be DNA two breaks. There could be a single strand break. There could be chemical rebonding happening, and all these form some products that need to be eliminated. We don't want them. And then there are different systems mentioned at the last, which uh, are incorporated in these organisms, which allow them to successfully get rid of the DNA damage product. So while studying Haloarchaea, there were a few questions that came to our mind. Like, hmm. Sorry, my slide is frozen. Maybe try to unshare your screen and share again. Okay. Yeah, so the questions that we had in our mind. Is RT's robust and efficient systems of DNA repair a characteristic of the domain archaea? Because archaea, all of them are mostly extremophiles. So is it common to all archaea or is it uh, restricted to haloarchaea? Then we had a question like, how does the environment affect it, the saline environment? How does it affect the DNA repair systems? Then the question we had in mind was the organisms that re receive similar kind of UV light. For example, we saw the Deinococcus radioneurons. It is also UV resistant. We have haloarchaea. It is also UV resistant. So are there similarities between the DNA repair systems in these organisms? And again, we had a question regarding lateral gene transfer. So what is lateral gene transfer? Lateral gene transfer is a non-section way of information transfer. So for example, there could be a foreign uh, DNA that gets incorporated into an unknown organism, and then it uh, receives it, and it continues to work with it. So has such an event uh, ever been happened in the haloarchial history? So these were the questions that happened uh, in our mind. And there were different types of analysis that could be done. So today I'll just go through one of the uh, analysis known as phylogenetic analysis, which help us answer such questions. So firstly, to start phylogenetic analysis, you need to go to a database. NCBI is a well-known database which provides information regarding the genes, proteins, assemblies, proteomes, and all that stuff. So what you need to do is you need to select the organisms that you're looking for and the protein. Here I look for UVRA. So UVRA is a, a protein that helps in identify where the UV damage has occurred. So from here, you can select the organism that you're looking for and you can download the protein. Once you have downloaded the protein, uh, for, for example, here I have the protein for Halobacterium salinarium and RC1. You could do this for all the organisms that you are interested in. It could be an archaea, a bacteria, and with all the similar proteins, for example, we are doing UVRA, we create a text file. With this text file, we use phylogenetic analysis software like Cluster, like phylogenetic, uh, phylogeny FR, and then we create phylogenetic trees. This one is taken from Dr. Dasarma's paper regarding the UVR system. And these trees, like we created this tree, but what is the importance of this tree? So phylogenetic analysis, usually the way we worked with it this summer, it was a comparative analysis. So we have an analysis with a special protein called 16S rRNA, which we used to create this tree with. So with this conserved protein, when we create a tree, we are able to identify which organism belongs to which domain. For example, if you have an unknown organism and then you take its 16S rRNA and create a tree like the way we did with uh, the software, you'll be able to identify where your 16S lies. For instance, if it lies with the halophytes, you can conclude that the unknown organism that you have is a halophyte. So this is the phylogenetic tree of life. And when you compare this 16S rRNA tree with your protein tree, 
you will be able to identify that there are, it is not congruent, like not everything is similar. There might be a bacteria near to your haloarchia. So why is it there? Because there might have been some event happening in the history or in recent times, which has caused those two uh, proteins to be similar, although they belong to different organisms. So such analysis did help us analyzing the questions that we had. And these trees can be really beautiful. We have a large number of softwares that create beautiful trees with beautiful colors and they give us beautiful conclusions. So that is why I wanted to show this uh, analysis method. And for conclusions, I would like to say is that astrobiology is a really new science with extremely high potential and which will help us understand our past, our evolution, our history, and also answer questions regarding is, are there more organisms apart from us in this universe? And organisms like extremophiles will surely help us understand this a better way, especially like the extreme ones that we have, like the haloarchia and the other ones. And with the advancing technology, we have all these sequencing technology, which allow us to sequence organisms fast with accurate results and create them into a database. And then we have all these softwares, the computer science methods that make the process really efficient and less time consuming. And I hope that all these combined, we will be able to contribute in the mission plan. Thank you. Yay, great job, Sagarika. Um, let me allow people to unmute if they'd like to. I think we have time for maybe one question. I see a question here in the chat from Matthew Ludwig. Um, he asks, am I right in saying that the high GC content is important for resisting DNA damage because of there being three hydrogen bonds between G and C versus two between A and T? Yes, the, the UV damage is more susceptible to, there is a susceptibility uh, in like there's an order, like TT is more susceptible to DNA damage. And that is surely due to the bonding. So yes, if there's high GC content, the combinations, like there's less TT combinations, so there's less DNA damage. And then we have another question from Sanjoy. Go ahead and unmute Sanjoy. Thank you, Sagarika, for a very interesting presentation. I was just curious if uh, halo tolerant or halophiles are also able to be tolerant or be comfortable in other forms of extremes. So can you be uh, you know, tolerant to salt and cold or tolerant to salt and radiation or tolerant to salt and high pressure? Yes, we have such organisms. We have a one called Harorobum locus profundi. It is uh, it's tolerant to salt and also is found in icy areas. Then we have some haloalkylophiles. Then there are ones that are tolerant to uh, salt as well as to acid. And some of them are do, um, to uh, complete the life cycle anaerobically. So these combinations are also present in haloarchia. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sagarika. Great job.